we'll just get started, I suppose. Uh, and uh, I won't be introducing you uh, formally. So Jan, if you can tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, a little bit about your work in, in education in libraries, and then okay. we'll get going. Okay, so I'm Jan McWaters. I have been a school librarian since 2008, technically, although I've been back in and out of the classroom. I think being a teacher librarian is, is a very different thing than I would ever have thought about doing when I was in school. So when I was growing up, I wanted to be an interpreter and I did that and it was fun and wonderful. And then I ended up teaching German and ended up as a librarian quite by chance, actually a, a friend who was a principal called and said, Hey, this great job over for you. It's a library aid, but you'd be great at it. And I was just finishing up my bachelor's degree. So I ended up going to do a master's in library science based on that experience. And have worked in colleges, I've worked in career colleges, I've worked in schools. And I think one of the most important things that people need to understand about librarianship is quite simply, we don't put books on shelves. <laughs> you don't get somebody right. with our experience to file things alphabetically, which is what putting books on shelves is. And that's one of the biggest right. things that you have to convince administrators is that a librarian is so much more than that. <clears throat> if you really just put books on your shelf, you need a library assistant. But one of the things that we do is we curate and manage a collection. And by curate, I mean that we have to know the curriculum. We have to know what every teacher is doing in their classroom. And we have to know what books are going to answer the questions that come up in the classroom. Yeah, So that right. they look into the library, they should see books that are relevant to what they are currently learning and that they want to check out. Right, right. Yes. So that's the curation and managing the collection is what it's, it, it is one of the biggest aspects of librarianship if you have a library. But I think it's important to realize you don't have to have a physical library today in order to need a librarian. And that's something that blows most people's minds. Like, how can you be a librarian without books? Yeah, sure. So one of the things that I always try and, and tell people is, you know, we already have books. We have very good public libraries in, in, in the United States. So all children technically have access to books although physically they may or may not ever get taken to the library. Mm -hmm. But with the onset of digitized libraries, children don't have to be taken to the library anymore. They can use their phone to access a book. They can use their phone to look information up. And we really need to start teaching information and media literacy skills much yeah. more explicitly in schools. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm, I'm sure this is probably the same the world over, but kids, you know, they read something online and they believe it. They, we have not taught them how to look at it critically and say, where is this information coming from? Who wrote it? Can I believe them? <laughs> Can I verify it elsewhere? You know, the things that as adults that we do, because maybe we just, maybe not every adult does that, but we really yeah, what do. Yeah, do you, do you, what do you think about that? I mean, on, in general, um, you're obviously working around school age children um, and seeing them develop or not develop those skills. Uh, but I, I think that you, you know, you question it yourself there. And I wonder in general, how much of the public, the adult public, um, really has and uses those skills to good effect. I don't think they do. I really don't. So we offered one time a couple of years ago, in our school, uh, access for parents to come in and have a learn how mm -hmm. to search the database night. We only had one parent show up. Wow. <laughs> which I thought was kind of scary. Yeah, yeah. Given the number of parents that want to, I mean, I do think most parents want to help their children. They don't want to do the homework, but you can't guide your child into good research skills if you don't have those right. good research skills yourself. Right, right. And yeah. I do think it's sad that we, we obviously have a lot of people who don't double check where information is coming from or ask those yeah. questions. Otherwise, we wouldn't yeah. be in this state we're in today. It seems so blatant, <laughs> doesn't it? Given given the way things are all around the world, really. But, um, you know, mm -hmm. it's certainly where you are and, and, and where I am and where we're from. Um, it seems so blatant. It seems like it's such an obvious problem. Yeah, I mean, it, it, getting kids to understand, even media, the best way to get them to learn to understand that they are being manipulated for want of a, I mean, it's maybe not that deliberate, so is to have them actually create stuff themselves and libraries should be a place and should offer a place for children to come and access the technology. Yeah, Cause not yeah. everybody has a podcast area at home. Not everybody has a green screen. Right. Sure. Yeah. So we would have our kids come in and I had them working one time with Powtoon, which is a, how to make a, like a mini cartoon. Okay. And getting them to develop the concept that just cause that music sounds good. It doesn't impact what you're making. Oh uh, yeah. Right. Okay. 
So they will be like, oh, this is my favorite song, so I'm going to put that as the background. I'm like, okay. <laughs> if you're doing something very smooth and nice, there's no use yeah. having a heavy rock background. And just yeah. getting them to understand that music manipulates them, that words manipulate them, yeah. that color, that images, that font style, that all of that is carefully yeah. selected to make you think something. Yeah. And yeah. getting them to pick apart, not just what is the information I'm getting from here, but how is it being presented. That's a huge librarian skill. Yeah teaching those kids that media literacy should be I, I think a prime focus in education and apart from <laughs> apart from it being done by somebody like you in the library um i mean whose whose responsibility do you see that as in the school setting right now it's nobody's responsibility it's one of those right. things you can't test media literacy with a quick abc schedule so yeah. i'm sorry i'm telling you my husband's handing me a oh, yeah, no problem. No problem. <laughs> um, as long as he doesn't mind being on the screen <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't he's a teacher as well in fact you should probably talk to him at some point in time <laughs> yeah, sure. um, so one of the things with media literacy is that it's not something that's tested in standardized testing so it's one of those mm. things that gets pushed to the bottom of the curriculum because if it's not tested and we have way too much in the curriculum anyway then it's probably not going to happen yeah. Well, that isn't the reason that it's not tested because it's new. I mean, there's, there's all these cyclical arguments here, right? That, that I see media literacy as being a thing that is, you could say it's been a necessity on some level since the printing press, perhaps. But really, given the, the explosion of the internet and the fact that content can now come from anywhere and anybody can make content, you don't have to be um, accepted by a publishing house or, or vetted by right. a newspaper. You can just put content online. Um, you know, no one's, no one's vetting these videos before I put them online. Right. Um, so content really can come from anywhere, uh, which means that, and that's, that's a relatively new, um, environment. Right. right? That, is, that's the so that means the media literacy really needs to be a priority for people now because they don't know where their content is coming from. So it's a fairly new, it might not be a new idea, but the level of importance is new. Um, right. And yet we're, you know, we're talking about, oh, well, it's not something that's on the curriculum. It's not tested. But it's because the curriculum hasn't been updated for so long. Uh, right. So isn't so, it just one of those so skills that should example, now be? You're yeah, gone. Yeah. I was going to say, our, uh, the element, so the school I was working in was K-12, and their elementary school just advertised for a media literacy teacher. Oh, okay. A teacher specifically for that. Okay, that's interesting. Specifically for that in the elementary school. And if you look at the, I, I kind of keep track of what's going on in our Congress. There is actually a bill moving through um, Congress right now to release $60 million worth of funding to promote media literacy education. Right, okay. That, of course, is backed by the fact that everybody's concerned that elections are being hacked and that we're not able, yeah. you know, not really looking at it from a, a good point that our kids need this as an everyday skill. Yeah, but sure. Although, I mean, you know. A million dollars for funding should not, I mean, it will barely touch the surface, but it's, it's yeah, a good start. Yeah, that's true. But I mean, if, if it, you know, I mean, voting is one of the areas that is, you know, particularly needed. This media literacy is particularly needed. So, I mean, that's, if anything was going to push it through, I suppose that's quite appropriate that, that voting and election problems would be the, would be the, the catalyst. Um, you talk about that, uh, the elementary school that's hiring their, their media literacy teacher, and then you talk about the funding as well. Do you know, are you aware, is the general model going to be that media literacy will be a, a subject in its own right with teachers? I would hope so. But like I said, we're a charter school, so we're able to push things through a little bit differently. Yeah, right, I see. I think until we really look at reassessing standardized testing. Yeah. It's going to be difficult. So most, most schools in Texas have by seventh grade what they call a tech apps teacher, which is technology applications where you, in theory, learn how to do Photoshop. Right. One okay. of the yeah. I pointed out, our kids do Photoshop, but then they have nowhere to practice. Yeah, you know, they I have see. an hour of class every other day. And then even in the library, we didn't have the desktops that had Photoshop installed because it's, it's mm. not an inexpensive program. So you teach oh. a kid, if you can't practice at it, that's like saying, let's learn basketball, but you can't have a ball at home. Yeah, right. Absolutely. You have to have, and that's where the libraries come in. You have to provide a space before and after school and during lunch times. But those extended hours mean extended salaries for teachers or assistants. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Plus, you've got to have, I mean, we did pretty well this year by putting up green screens. Although yeah, they wow. can be done with paint. We also had little podcasting tents where the kids could go in and record or read. Nice. A lot of them read. I even caught a teacher in there reading one day. Oh, that's great. <laughs> so that's good. Like many, there are actually <laughs> many beach tents 
that you could use for getting changed on a beach. Okay, they yeah, could, yeah. We just put up a, a couple and we called them podcasting tents and told oh, the kids. that's really nice. You know, if, you want to, if you want a podcast, you can go in there so that you're not distracted by other people looking at you. Yeah, sure. Oh, that's really good. Fire, but yeah, it worked. That's really good. So, I mean, yeah. it sounds your, your library, at least where you are, sounds to be a very kind of living space with a lot of people moving around and coming and going as they please. Is that the way, is that right? Yeah. Actually it is, but that's also partly because it's completely open. There are no walls and it's right at the central okay. crossroads. So kids walk through oh, it wow. every day. They're going from one class to another. They're not supposed to, they're supposed to go around it, but. And that's that has a really interesting cost. idea. Yeah, yeah talk, it's talk an about that. Thing. Thing. It looks beautiful. I mean, we had all these big steps that you could just, we, we made, we started a sewing club because the kids wanted pillows and I didn't have the budget for it. So okay. we wrote a group with some machines and they made the furnishings. Wow. <laughs> Unfortunately, we made them out of vinyl so we can just spray them down with, with Lysol or Clorox right now and keep wow. using them. Yeah. So yeah, it was a comfortable space. It was never quiet. Unfortunately, there was nowhere for students that really wanted to have a quiet study, Carol. It would have, sure. you know, there was things that we could have improved on, but sure. it was... And of course, the flip side of having it completely open is kids don't always check their books out. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I see. Uh, Most so, of yeah, them I mean, I can see the challenges. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. No, I can see how the challenges would arise. It's a really nice idea, though. I've not seen a, I've not seen a school library set up like that before, I think. And I think it does seem, on one level, it's just obvious. It seems like you'd get a lot more kids in there in, in that kind of open, you know, open war concept because the library is often tucked away in a corner somewhere even when a school has a good library, it's kind of obscured. Um, so it's, it's a, an effort to get there. You have to consciously make that decision to go to the library. Um, mm -hmm. It must be, yeah, there must be something slightly more motivating about having that in the open. Right, no, it, it is good. And there's, the, the good thing about the administration I had was that they understood that books will go missing. Because of course that's a librarian's biggest fear. If you start the year with a thousand books, you should end the year with a thousand books and there should never be anything. <laughs> yeah, right. They just accepted. Kids need to read. If We worked really hard with trying to get kids to check books out, but sometimes they're in a hurry. Or they grab a book while they were waiting for lunch and start leafing through it and then forget they hadn't checked it out. I don't think it was deliberate. Right. Yeah, yeah, sure. You have to have a very um, understanding administration to run a library like that. Yeah, there's something heartening about books being stolen anyway, right? I mean, right, theft yeah. is theft, but if, if people are stealing books, that's something about that that's kind of endearing. <laughs> you would notice that certain authors disappear. Like oh, our graphic okay. novels, we eventually had to move all of the graphic novels to within my oh. eyes <laughs> because they were, I, I'm a big, I'm, I'm not a big graphic novel as in like Superman and stuff, but there's some amazing graphic novels out there and they yeah. are great to get kids reading. And the, the good I've, thing is yeah. a lot of them are socially oriented. Um, you did mention at the start um, about the requirement for the librarian being to have a master's, is that right? Right, so in Texas, at some point in time, they finally realized that a librarian, a teacher librarian was different from just somebody who managed the books. Yeah. So the requirement in Texas is you must have a bachelor's, you must have worked as a teacher for two to three years, you must have a master's in library science with a specialty in school librarianship. Right, okay. And then I went one step after that and did an extra year in distance education and um, copyright issues because I could see the copyright issues in general in librarianship they expect you to be this amazing expert on copyright but in reality you only have one maybe two classes in in your master's program so uh, what's the what's the importance of that why is that a thing you have to be so aware of? well when you're working with teachers there's a thing called fair use so you can use copyrighted uh -huh. materials in the classroom without asking for asking right. permission uh -huh. but we also need to teach children that they can't just do that as well you know right. just because yeah, we're in the classroom there are laws and rules that allow us to do that but we yeah, have okay. to be able to for students. So if a student is going to use a copyrighted item in a paper or maybe today we're talking about making movies, we're talking about doing green screen. Yeah, great. If you use something and you just show it in the classroom, that's perfectly okay too. That comes under fair use. But if you use something and you put it on the web, it gets a little different because then it's not fair use right. for educational purposes anymore. Right. And the same with um, teaching online was not covered by the fair use laws. So. Oh, wow. Okay. Right, so t because you're converting stuff to digital, so you're changing yeah, it. Yeah, sure. You're broadcasting it. Yeah, right, yeah. I see. You're also yeah. broadcasting it. So in 2002, they went back and, and wrote a law called the Teach Act, and I got teaching education and something, copyright harmony or something. But teachers, okay. it's the Teach Act. And that allows you to use the same fair use laws within a digital classroom, but there are certain specifications, like you have to say this material is copyrighted, you must 
expressly explain that it's not to be downloaded and used for anything other than the classroom. You know, right. There's a lot of, well, not major rules, but things that protect that. And, and teaching kids to understand the difference between sure. copyright and plagiarism is another thing librarians should be doing. Yeah, right, okay. Our best discussions with eighth graders, the art teacher brought them to talk about it. And we ended up taking three whole lessons because the kids just had so many questions. Yeah, One of I which bet. Was, I make a meme. Will the, will the copyright police come and come and get me if I use a copyrighted photograph for a meme? Yeah, right. It's far more complex than you'd realize. I mean, you're already saying things that I was unaware of. Uh, so if, for example, I, while I have you here, uh, if, for example, um, you get your students to do a, a paper or something um, where the fair use would, uh, would be well in play, but then as a part, as a just an interesting way of doing it. You ask them to post their essay to a blog rather than just hand it into you. Does that then become a problem? Right, it, it can and, and it wow. shouldn't. So one of the big no, things- No, it shouldn't, of course. The COVID thing was a number of principals and firemen and policemen and former presidents that were reading books online. Technically, yeah. that's a copyright violation. Right. So our school came and said, hey, we want to put these, uh, we want to read books online. I'm like, okay, we can do that within the concepts under teach that we can put it into a closed classroom, share the link with the parents. And yes, it's okay. But right. you can't put it on Facebook. So you can't turn then, that into a video. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Right. Then the response came back. Well, the, you know, President Obama's doing it or such and such a mayor is doing it. <laughs> yeah. So it does, I, I think a lot of people are pushing the envelope and we are at a point where we need to look at yeah. changing those laws. So one of the things I read this great book and I, about copyright, and I cannot remember for the life of me what the, the lady that wrote it is called, but she talked about a very innovative English teacher who had had his kids do Shakespeare using the Simpsons. Okay. So Simpsons are, every, every kid loves them. Yeah, of course. I didn't like it until my, 12 year, my then 12 year old said, mom, you just gotta watch it. <laughs> yeah. So I did and I was converted. But then the question comes into play, if you're using, well, of course, Shakespeare's out of copyright, but if, yeah. but the Simpsons isn't. So if you're using Shakespeare's material, it's perfectly okay. If you're using Bart Simpson as you've rewritten Shakespeare's story and have Bart Simpson telling it, is that a copyright violation? Right, yeah, wow. And that's a huge question because there are teachers doing it. I think in general, most places are not likely to sue an individual teacher. So yeah. I did some research last year. One of our school districts had gotten into trouble in Texas and they ended up with a $9 million fine for copyright wow. violation. When, when, they're being, when that's happening, it's the, the content creator that sues them, presumably? It wouldn't just be somebody on their behalf, or, right? Or the copyright owner. So the content creator may not be the copyright owner. Ah, of course, yeah. Wow. So if I write a lesson plan at school, under school time, using school equipment, that lesson plan belongs to the administration. Yeah, sure. If I write my lesson plan at home on my own equipment in my own time, I am then the copyright holder because it's right. not work for home anymore. So there's some very complex issues. And I, to me, the, the students just need to know that you cannot just take anything off the web and use it as yeah. if it were your own. You have to ask questions. May I use this? I had my students when I worked in Germany. They want, we were doing, I was teaching German and we were doing some sort of slideshow. I can't remember what it was, but one girl wanted to use a photograph from Flickr. And I said, Hey, just write to the owner and say, I want to use this. Yeah, See what okay. happens. The owner wrote back and said, of course you have absolute my full permission. Brilliant. Yeah. That's really good. <laughs> Sometimes that makes you then know for the rest of her life, right? That's brilliant. Absolutely. And we had a, one of our theater teachers that I worked with wanted to do a play and it was, he had one copy of it. It was no longer available. It had been written forever ago. And I said, hey, we, I was able to track down the, who the copyright owner was. And it was actually the guy and he's like in his 90s right now. Okay. We were, sure, make as many copies as you want. And he said, no, get away from my, <laughs> yeah. So oh, that's sometimes really good. Yeah. it's just a matter of asking the question. Yeah. But I, I do think we're going to see with the ability to create things, like I said, the, the Simpsons example I thought was really good. It was innovative, it was creative. And one of the things that the copyright law says, if you have changed something dramatically. Yeah. So if I took a book and put it in the hand of a statue and the book was now just a teeny portion of the statue, that might be sufficient change. Yeah, right. The problem is with copyright is fair use is always a jury, not a jury trial, but it's, it goes to sure. the courts. It's wow. very great. But you know, it's it's what, the, what, oh, no, go ahead, go ahead. 
Um, so one of the things that we did in class that was has still been puzzling me 12 years later, if you have somebody in a virtual world that creates or mimics something, so that the thing that we were given was a designer handbag. Right. Somebody creates the file for a designer handbag in uh, Second Life and oh, yeah, sells yeah. that file to people who wander around in Second Life because they want to have that fancy handbag. Yeah. yeah. Is that a copyright violation? <laughs> I suppose it, I suppose my guess would be it depends on is there a Louis Vuitton store in the Second Life that they could have bought the bag from? <laughs> you know, right, are you taking? <laughs> they don't make those yeah, digital Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, sure. That's, so yeah. That, it was a really interesting, intriguing discussion type question. Yeah. And that's the type of things I think we ought to be asking our children to provoke. Yeah, I think, what belongs yeah. to whom? When is it okay to actually use something that somebody else has created? I mean, yeah. is it okay to use me? Right. And that's a great question. I mean, and, and that comes up in every single, every bet, single bet, discussion bet. about copyright. I mean, there's so much to talk about on this topic already. I mean, I'm immediately thinking, um, first of all, the other things that, the other thinking skills, the, the, the critical thinking skills that come into play when you're just having that kind of conversation, right? When you're just asking, should, you know, what do we think? Should this be legal? Should this be okay? Is this in violation? Um, of course, it's a legal matter, so you can do the research and you look up the clauses and you can speak to the relevant people. But there's also a lot of critical thinking there and just, you know, in the moment when I want to use a particular piece of material, uh, just trying to determine the parameters that I'm playing with. Well, okay, it's this kind of material and I'm using it in this way. So what do I uh, expect I should be able to do? There's a lot of critical thinking there. And provoking the conversation is, okay, well, the law tells me I can't do this, but I'm pretty... I feel pretty confident I should be able to do it. And, you know, is, is there somebody I can write to? And is there something I can try to do no, about this? It's, not. it's one of those yeah, things. Right. One of the other things that's, that keeps rearing its ugly head for want of a better thing is how do we show streaming movies? So, for example, I've paid for Netflix or Amazon. I can't show that in the classroom because it's considered yeah. a public showing as opposed to a private showing. Right. But there's not really a way for a school to purchase, not a reasonably priced way for a school right, to purchase. Right, right. So I think... You know, there's a lot of questions with te as technology advances and gives us the option to do so many things that we couldn't do, yeah. then laws are going to have to catch up. And especially when you're working, when I worked in an international school in Germany, it was very difficult for me to explain to teachers, it doesn't matter what copyright law you are used to, we have to follow the German law because we are based sure, in Germany. Sure, sure. And when you start realizing that copyright law is very different across the world for different things. Right. Right. It, yeah. No, that makes sense. The other thing that has me thinking as well, um, especially with students, um, partly because they won't have learned it yet because, because they're just, they're, they're young, um, but also because of their, their own creative endeavors. Um, you, you would want the, the students, the children in schools to be learning the other side of this as well. If they're creating their own, I mean, how many kids now have a YouTube channel, or a right. blog or something where they're creating content and they don't know how to, presumably, they wouldn't know how to copyright their own stuff. I mean, I barely, I used to write some poetry and things online and I used to use a Creative Commons license there. I'll be honest, I don't really understand it. I just kind of, I've, you know, I, the, there must be so many kids creating content that they don't, they're not putting, they're not protecting they the way they should. It. And Creative Commons is one thing that I think librarians should be introducing. When I, I worked as an instructional technologist for a while and that was one of the things that we really concentrated on helping our children to understand that. Because yes, A, they are creating, and B, I, they don't want other people to use, and, that, and that, that, that's how I actually get them to understand, like, if you have made the movie, right. how do you feel if somebody else right. then takes that movie and pretends it's theirs, versus yeah. somebody who takes that movie and says, hey, John Smith made this, and here's yeah, the information, sure. more, more of his stuff. And, and that's how we get through to them, is to make them understand it's not just about what you want, it's also about what other people want, which impacts course, yeah. you. Yeah. And that, yeah. like I said, those lessons tended to drag on and the kids were all actively engaged because they yeah, do that's have right. that. I mean, that's a great topic. We, we often talk about motivating, motivating kids. Yeah. Getting yeah. kids down and think about what they're doing because it, it still blows my mind. The number of kids that say, yeah, I have a YouTube channel in sixth right. grade. I'm, yeah. There's going to be so many now. Right. I mean, I see very, very young children with, with, you know, content of their own now. Um, and they can't understand the copyright laws. Maybe their parents do, but, but probably not. Um, anyway, one thing that does get my hackles up as well, I must admit, I, I think partly because, um, I don't know, partly because I'm predisposed to think this way, but also perhaps because I used to, you know, write stuff online and, and uh, you know, put my own work online. 
I really hate to see, whether it's on LinkedIn and Facebook or, or wherever else, uh, people putting up posts where they've clearly copied from somebody else and there's just no mm -hmm. attribution. There's the lack of attribution. And I, so, even I feel there's a gray area now. You've mentioned memes a few times. I mean, there are some things that get passed around so much. You could never work out the person who made it. But there are other things where somebody's, you know, written a poem and then somebody else posts it and says, here's how I'm feeling today. And they copy this poem that clearly they've taken from somewhere else. And there's no attribution. Right. But we have to teach our kids. So one of the big discussions I had with my former boss just a couple of months ago was we unfortunately have a lot of plagiarism. And I think yeah. that's common across the world. That's certainly not specific it's be. to one. It's got to be. Yeah. My argument was based on research, if we teach children what plagiarism is and we try to understand. So when I went to school back in the 70s, you got an essay, you went to the local library, every single kid in school used that one encyclopedia. The teachers were probably, you know, the, the summary, summaries that we used were probably almost identical, but cut sure, and paste yeah. was not an option. Right. Today, we live in a world where cut and paste is an option, and we have to accept that that is now culturally acceptable, but still explain yes. based on that, just because everybody does it, doesn't mean it's okay to do it. So that, to me, the teaching of how to avoid plagiarism yeah. should be something that starts very early yeah. and goes on. But the, the problem is the earlier you started. So one of the things talking about culture was if you tell a third grader, you know, write down which book you found the information in, or if you don't tell them because they're using one specific textbook and it's kind of silly to have them write because they're, they're arguing. Yeah, as I well. see. Yeah. Yeah. Who knows which book I got it from? We've only got one book. <laughs> yeah. Right. But then they move into sixth and seventh grade and they're using multiple books, but we've already established the fact that if it's a textbook that they don't have to cite it. Right. And that continues as they find more and more books. So they find something online. They think it's okay. I can just give the URL. Yeah. But right. If, on it's it's not static it may change yeah. by tomorrow yeah so course, get yeah. To understand how to cite and then it's further complicated by the fact that we have so many different citation i don't know why we can't just have a yeah. Citation. yeah right yeah yeah you know whether it's mla or apa or of course, yeah. It, it just doesn't make sense. yeah yeah it's no, really an ongoing starting at a very early age that you have to say where you found the information and I always tell our kids, that also shows me, A, if you're misunderstanding something, it's not just that I'm being picky that you have to give me the citation. I want to know where you got your information from so I can see yeah. where the misunderstanding is. Yeah. But I also want you to share what you're reading because you cannot be knowledgeable about a topic unless you're reading multiple areas. Yeah. yeah. No, you can't just look at one textbook and say, this is definitively what happened. Sure. And now we're, we're blending together, you know, the 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 plagiarism conversation with the media literacy as well, right? I mean, if you're just going to one source for all of your, for all of your information, then we have a, we have, we're back to media literacy. How reliable is that source and how broad is the view that you're getting from it, right? right. And the assumption of course is if it's a school selected textbook and I, and I don't know how um, different states do this, but Texas has this, A, we're a huge state. So a lot of people sure. pander to what we want to buy in Texas because it's a yeah. massive market. Yeah, that makes but, sense one would assume that the teachers have some say in selecting textbooks, but I know as a librarian, I have often seen textbooks that are purchased by the state mm -hmm. and they're not touched. Yeah, right. They're just sitting there because the teachers know they can find more accurate or more relevant material online. Or in, I mean, there's some great open educational resources and that brings you to another point of librarianship, managing all of those open educational resources, especially for homeschoolers, so that they're in one place on one website so that you can- yeah. But then again, it becomes if it's curated, who did the curating? Who right. says these are good sites? Yeah, right. Yeah, this is, I mean, that's a, I would, it might be you in another conversation, I don't know, but there's the, that, the open education movement is something I want to have a, 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 a good conversation about because I think there's a lot of good stuff happening there. I don't know enough about it. Are there any risks in, I mean, is it, is it a, a messy area? Is it something that you can, I, I don't know, it's, it's quite a new movement, I gather. Well, it can be, and there's a lot of librarians now. There's a lot of open educational resource librarian positions popping open. Right, okay. Um, a lot more people. So several of the conferences I've gone to in the past couple of years, it's been a big area because I think a lot of people are starting to realize from a financial point of view, the purchasing of textbooks is a massive waste of money. Right. When all of this information is readily available online. And there's some, there's some really good websites. So yeah, that could be a whole other conversation, but a lot of teachers create great material and put the stuff out there. Yeah, and sure. 
you know, it just needs to be curated and, and made available and, and shared. I know my husband does blend, he's a physics and computer science teacher. He does, he has a blended classroom. Okay. Or classroom actually. So they, they go home, they watch the lecture or whatever it is he's prepared and then they come back in and they spend their time in class doing. Oh, yeah, great. Okay. So, and that's a great way, especially right now with, with so many kids that are stuck at home. Mm-hmm watch a good lecture or find a good open educational resource or tour the Louvre or whatever it is. I mean, there's so much great stuff out there. Yeah. Yeah. From home when they're not in a classroom and then let's keep that classroom time for, for classic conversations and things that they're stuck with, things that they need somebody to answer their questions. Yeah. 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 I think what we are is definitely, it's here to stay and it's getting bigger and it definitely. That's right. Yeah. It it seems that the more we talk now, the more apparent it becomes that so much of your, work is in the digital sphere uh obviously right. you think of the librarian as being situated in the library um but that now is such a clearly an increasingly digital uh space um right. you mentioned earlier even about mm, students not not having to check out a book anymore because they can get the digital versions or you know visit the digital library do you have any sense of uh remorse do you lament in any way the the shift to digital media and, and, and fewer print books or do you think it doesn't matter what's your personal kind of feelings about it i love reading a book i personally don't care if it's on my kindle or if it for me it's the content a lot of people like to have a book in their hands and i don't think there are fewer books being published and printed sure. and i don't think that's going to change and i'll tell you why one of the major reasons why we didn't have as many digital books as i would have liked to have had in the school library is cost so when okay. you purchase a digital book you don't actually purchase the book you rent it for a year or you lease it for a year. Mm. So I would get a digital copy and access, you know, the ability to implement it into my library system and I would have it for a year. Right. I buy a print book for the same price. Even if I buy a paperback, it, it's going to last three or four years. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So I just don't think schools are going to have the budget for all of that right now. And I know what yeah. of our English well why can't you just get the kindle version it's on amazon for it's because kindle is attached to an account yes right so i can't just there's just no ready. way of getting around the fact that it, we have yeah. to purchase from the publishers and in fact a lot of publishers right now are saying they don't want to sell libraries digital copies in the first i think it was the first six weeks there's, there's actually um legislation trying we're, we're trying to get that change but they don't want to sell digital books to libraries in the first six weeks because they feel that it reduces their sales of the print book okay and that's, that's just a very specific targeting of libraries that should not yeah. be i mean if i can go out and buy the digital book myself i should be able to purchase as a librarian for my clients yeah yeah it's yeah of course. Topic. It's, it's ongoing right now so we'll see where okay. it ends up it's probably going to be more informed by the financial side of things than, than anything else, I imagine. Yeah, people who, who make and sell books do not want yeah. to give up their no, business. No. It's, not, it's not their job to make things easy and readily available, but no. it's our job as librarians to fight to make sure that everyone yeah. has access to information. Yeah, it's a lot of powerful. Of sure, no, it's an important position to be in, I think. Um, then I also wonder, so you've again, the digital side of what you do. And also you've talked about the various other activities that go on in, inside your library, the physical space. So you've got the podcasting, you've got the green screens, you've got kids coming in and uh, using the computers for research and things. How much of your, your time or the, t- the, the library time um, is just reading and how much of it is all of the other stuff? Is reading, is reading still the majority focus of the library, do you think? It is. In okay. a lot of cases. So I, mean, I was actually hoping to move it away from being that, but we, we have a lot of kids who really love to read. Yeah. So fortunately, I had never had a, a limit on the number of books that you could check out. Okay. <laughs> so we had some kids going into spring break with 15 books and they, wow. they might make them last for the whole of the COVID experience. Yeah, wow. again. <laughs> but I, I do think that they appreciated the fact that our tables were on wheels, they could wheel two tables together and, and have a conversation. Yeah, yeah. One of the most, or two of the most popular things in our library were jigsaw puzzles. Okay. Wild, but we had to, we'd put one out every week and what, as soon as it was done, somebody would have the, the fun of putting it away. Oh, wow. <clears throat> the other thing, Connect Four. So we <laughs> had a bunch of kids. Our kids would often get dropped off early and the logical place to put them is in the library. Oh. And we ended up with this huge strategy thing going on. The other thing that we did was every week I would have a, a logic puzzle. We'd put it up on the board and the kids would have uh, okay. three. Different- and yeah, well, that was, 
there was a couple of weeks where I didn't do it because I just got so busy and they'd be like, hey, where's the puzzle today? <laughs> and then I realized the teachers were doing it and they were including it in their classroom because, you know, logical thinking is very important. Yeah. Yeah. Look at it yeah. and understanding. And a lot of it was those trick questions. I can't think of one right off the top of my head, but if you really read the question effectively, it would have been obvious. But a lot of right. times they and they see what they want to see, but that's not what we want them to do. We want them to, to start really looking at things. So yeah, of course. Yeah. That was a really a fun, you know, we did it once, once a week for a year. And that's amazing. That awesome. really uh, highlighting the difference now between a library and a library with a librarian. I mean, right. uh, you know, again, as a room with books in it, that's uh, just, a, it's of massive value, I think, to any school to have a library, a, a room with books and a space where, where children can go to read. But all of the things that you've just described are things that wouldn't happen without the librarian. They're, they're, right. not, gonna, they're not gonna materialize by themselves. Um, and nope. you're really turning that into a much more valuable space than, than it already is. Um, and also, so many things have come up in this conversation, uh, media literacy, all that we talked about, about the, the copywriting, plagiarism as well as a separate conversation. Mm -hmm. Now you've brought up logic and critical thinking, which we've, we've touched on a couple of times. And these are things that I um, advocate quite heavily for in the work that I do. Uh, these are things that should be embedded into the curriculum. And they should be, because this is why I asked you earlier, uh, whose responsibility you think some of these things should be because it's been my opinion um, that these should be kind of central to the the entire curriculum there should be you should be learning about the concept of plagiarism from all of your teachers and all of your subjects I think um, and critical thinking should be something that you're developing in all of your classes but evidently it's not and um, I must admit I've never really thought before about uh, the the role that the, the librarian can be playing Most in that and kind of filling in that filling in these gaping holes in what we should be learning at school or, or but aren't um and you're doing so much of that work it seems right and i think that a lot of people don't realize but librarians should also be responsible for developing professional development within the school yeah right so that we should be putting out hey here's how you integrate this into the classroom right here's yeah. what you should know and here's and again is and that's one of the reasons why texas requires its librarians to be teachers as well as librarians so right. you can you can have a master's in library science, but you cannot become a school librarian unless you get actually actively go out and teach for two right, years. Right, right, right. That's the reason you have to understand what the teachers are doing in the classroom yeah. and how to integrate the skills that you bring into the teacher's professional development so that it does filter down there. I mean, I think that is a very important librarian role. And the other important role of the librarian is to train administrators that so that's our role. And that's the toughest. <laughs> right. Administrators look yeah. and say, but you put books on shelves. <laughs> yeah. To, to what extent do you have to really sell yourself? I imagine that oh, must yeah. be a lot of your. Yeah, that is, uh, I, most library, school librarians will tell you that's a good 20%. You're constantly yeah, sitting, imagine. you've got a great principal, you're, you're good to go. For <laughs> most people, they're like, well, I know what a librarian does. You give books out because that's yeah. what they did when I went to school. Yeah. In fact, when my, my assistant started two years ago, she looked and we had the conversation about what librarians really do. And she said, Oh no, my school librarian just checked out books. I'm like, oh no, you're going to see your school librarian did a lot more than just check yeah, out books. Right, right. Yeah. In yeah, fact, that was how my business got started. Was I had a friend that I used to work with, and she took a job as in a, a very small charter school, and they gave her the position of librarian as one of her titles. And she had three thousand mm. books in her eyes, and she called me frantically and said, "You made this look so easy. <laughs> I have no idea what I'm doing." So I went over and, and I, I helped that school out and then gradually the business idea grew that there are a lot of people out there that really need that. Yeah, I would tell us a bit more about because I wonder as well now, given uh, some of the misunderstanding around the role that you've, that we've, you know, you've just described um, and the fact that the, your, your duties are not central to the curriculum. Um, you know, you go, you go out there, you've got your teaching experience, you've got your master's degree, you get into a school, get into the position, I assume you then don't have a lot of support the way that you would hope that the rest of the faculty would be quite heavily supported by the, the principal, the management, so on. The, the librarian, I suspect, is kind of, you're left to your own devices a bit. You are. So a lot of times, and every school I've worked in, I've always made it an effort to sit down with a principal and try and explain what it is that I expect to be doing. Yeah. Uh, Big problem, if you have a big school district and they have a district librarian who 
is actively out there for the librarians, it's less of an issue. In a smaller school, they, you really are struggling against the person who thinks either A, I don't have books, therefore I don't need a librarian, or B, I have a librarian and she should be putting books on the shelves. And the way I talked to my last boss before, before I actually got an assistant, I said, you are overpaying me to put books on shelves. Right. From a financial point of view, a sixth yeah. grader can file things alphabetically. Sure. That's, sure. <laughs> you want me to do what you're paying me my rather large salary to do? You got to get somebody to do the sure. stuff. That, yeah. Yeah. And that they listened and they got, I ended up with one assistant and then she wanted to go part time. So I ended up with two assistants, right. which was great. One was busy becoming a teacher, and the other one was busy becoming a deaf interpreter. Oh, wow, and that's great! Really intelligent. I had had a, an awesome library. Yeah, yeah. But wow. you have to have a lot of times. Schools will say, especially right now, librarians are, are looking a little scared because we're looking at budget cuts because tax yeah. revenue. Right. Okay. And the first person to go. <laughs> It may often be the librarian because the perception is there that well they don't have direct contact with kids they're not they don't have a great book they we can live yeah. without a librarian for you. yeah I mean I remember not just the librarian like the school librarian as we're talking about I remember and I've been I've been outside of the UK for a very long time now so it was it was since I left but um, a massive cut of the the public libraries as well because again when the tax when the budget goes down. That's mm -hmm. one of the first places, even at the public level. So let alone, you know, the school libraries and the teachers and uh, the, the, the librarians in those spaces. The other way around. When money is short, it should go to the library to provide more and more things for people that have no money and no access. Yeah, 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 right. So one of the things, I don't know if you, and I haven't been in a British library in a long time, of course, but if you walk into an American library right now, you can, you can borrow things like cake sheet pans. You can borrow tools. <laughs> So we've become more of a yeah, central. Yeah, I recall. I don't know. I don't know to what extent, but I recall. I recall something like that. I recall there being more than books, anyway. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So puzzles. Our local librarian. Yeah, you, you puzzles. Can, they would have had. They're not checked out per se. It's done on an honor basis. You can go in, take a jigsaw puzzle, yeah. take it home, bring it back. Right, and so many people right. like the idea that their their jigsaw puzzle shelves are like full to brim. Yeah. So, yeah. I think the, the concept of making any library a much more central and readily accessible and the same libraries have, have gone out of their way, the public libraries, at least to ensure that some students who are maybe in rural areas have access. So one of the things that was being explored a couple of years ago, long before COVID came out, and it was, a, I think it was a small Nebraskan community. Obviously kids go home and they may not have access to the internet because they're too rural as opposed to, sure. or, or maybe it's just poverty as well. Yeah. So there's a way that, and I don't really understand the technology behind this, but there's a way that you can use the unused space that they use on um, television channels to get <laughs> okay. the internet out to those areas. So that's something that could, I mean, if we're looking at another round of COVID where kids may have to stay home, that's a great way of getting, of getting wow, it yeah. out yeah. rural areas because most people do have some form of cable TV. Yeah, wow, that's uh, wow, fascinating. <laughs> yeah, it's mind boggling. Was, I, yeah. I, the only thing I knew about it was I'd read an article on it in the American Library Journal, the, the LA Journal. And at the time, I was trying to wrap my head around like, how do you use the I'm not, Yeah, I'm not even going to try to wonder how. I'm, I, it's an but amazing piece of, it's an amazing it fact. Does work. I will, wow. It is used in rural areas, and it's something that we could and should be looking at, and librarians are pushing that. They're right, at the forefront right. pushing that information to make sure that our kids that are either economically disadvantaged or they're just in a rural area so that they get access to the information that everybody else yeah. gets. It sounds that losing the librarian, not only are you losing all of those, you know, the access to all of those resources in the school that we've been talking about, it sounds as well like you're losing quite a lot of motivated activism. It sounds like the, the, the quite kind of... Uh, aggressively activist about about a lot of these things as well is there is there a an association of librarians is there a, is there right. a, so a, texas a has the biggest school association so the texas library association is the biggest library association in the united states probably because wow. we're a big state and people oh, yeah. tend to come from. so we have an annual conference which offers thousands of pd in fact i was one of the guest speakers there last year that right. um are scheduled to be <laughs> but it, the it was unfortunately the week after spring break when everything was totally locked oh, down oh yeah okay. okay so hopefully we'll get back in next i was supposed to be talking about graphic novels and their importance in media literacy education okay. and more things right. and yeah so librarians tend to be very activist if you look at them there's all sorts of articles about librarians learning how to use to administer what is that overdose drug because a lot of 
homeless people tend to congregate around the public library. Yeah, sure. Wow. And there was one in, I, I want to say it was Philadelphia, but I might be wrong, where they were actively, the librarians are actively trained in administering the drug that is used for when people have overdosed. Wow, yeah, so is that not, not, not supreme. Yeah, wow. Yeah. Librarians have an association that gathers books and takes them to underserved countries and sets up libraries in schools. I mean, sure. we're out yeah, there yeah. doing a lot of different things. Yeah, 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 wow. Well, not that far yet. I'm sticking with Texas, but. Yeah, sounds like you've got your hands full anyway. Right. <laughs> you, you, you said as well, um, you, you mentioned direct contact. So obviously you don't have, um, you don't have uh, a curriculum and you don't have a grade book. You're not kind of, you're not assessing the students. But how much as well, how much just interpersonal contact with the students do you have? I remember uh, sort of, you know, a lot of kids would go, would hang around in the library and just kind of chat with the librarian. And uh, it was a very interpersonal role. Right. We do have a lot of, I mean, that's how I find out what kids are interested in to help sure. develop the collection. There's a lot of conversation goes on. If they come into the library, I drop whatever I'm doing to help them with whatever it is, no matter how important it is. Mm. And one of the things I'm very reliant on are the teachers who are willing to push the envelope. So there was several teachers that I worked with last year that were just like, hey, let's work on a class together. So oh, okay. we work together. We develop the, the unit together. We hopefully model collaboration to the kids. But yeah. if a teacher doesn't want to do that, or, and a lot of times teachers are like, oh, I've got so much content, I can't add this extra thing. Mm -hmm. We're very reliant on having great teachers that, that are willing to push the envelope and then sharing what you're doing so that other teachers hopefully look at it and think, oh, I, I want some of that action. I want to try that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think that, that's a general problem for instructional technologists and for librarians across the, the, across the whole of Texas because we, we do have instructional technologists. The district I worked at, which is very close to where we're at. They have an instructional technologist in every school. Most okay. districts have one or two instructional technologists that have to cover multiple schools. So and yeah, they, right. they don't have that personal interaction with the teachers. Yeah. But as a librarian, if you're doing both roles, which is, you know, instructional technology is still part of the library. Then if you're actually in the school, in the library, and teachers are walking past to get from one class to another, you, you can, what are you doing? What are you teaching? Or I actively spend a lot of time looking at the curriculum and saying, okay, what, what okay. are they working on right now? And as an IB school, I work closely with the NYP coordinator to make sure that as they're developing units, that we look like, how can we fit and how can we integrate? Yeah. yeah. Well, do you get many, many classes taught in the library? Do the teachers ever, ever kind of come and do their lessons in the library? Like Every now and again, normally it's because there's some problem in, you know, we, we were having problems with flooding last year or the, right. the acre okay. wasn't working. Yeah. And sometimes Fair they just want to... Sometimes a teacher will just say, hey, can I come teach in the classroom for a yeah. bit of a change of pace? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of times, the, the problem with the open library is it is not quiet. So it makes it very Oh, yeah, difficult. of course, for you, yeah, yeah. Especially if you're, the, the time, the, we're right beside the cafeteria. So as the kids are amassing before lunch, it gets very noisy. It's impossible to teach then. Yeah, but right. But had it where the teachers will say, hey, could you come to my classroom? And once okay. I had a library was able to leave the library I often go into the teacher's classroom and just say right. okay this is what I'm studying who needs help or the teachers might actually send a student or a small group to the library to yeah. work on something if they specifically need assistance yeah, yeah okay so what's your uh what's your absolute favorite way to spend your time then in the library what's the thing you like doing most of all of your responsibilities and duties and I think working with the kids with the green screen last year, I had to say was absolutely the best. So one yeah. of the, um, our design teacher had had the kids design a desk organizer that they were supposed to market to teachers. Okay. <laughs> and some of the kids came in and they're like, look at this great desk organizer. I'm like, no, 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 no. You're not selling the desk organizer. You're selling the clean desk. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> can do when you've got a clean desk so they actually came up with the idea of doing um a teacher in hawaii talking about what a difference this desk organizer had made and they dropped the green to the hawaiian background in so it's fun to see that you know they can get super creative but you have to kind of guide them a little bit and give them the possibility of being creative and say you don't have to do what everybody else is doing sometimes you can pr approach things from a different angle yeah so I think working with the technology was probably one of my favorites the year before we had just started, and we didn't get to do it this year because of COVID, we had started a poetry slam. Oh, wow. And at six o'clock, the principal jumped right in. She provided lemonade and cookies because it was, it was <laughs> April and it was hot because April's poetry month. 
And by the end of it, we had kids going to the shelves, grabbing poetry books and saying, yeah, wow. out to. it was super motivating. And we, we thought about trying to get it done during the COVID thing, but we weren't, we just did not have the ability and the motivation and yeah, 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 yeah. right slap bang in the middle of it. So hopefully whoever the new librarian is, will take that up and. Oh yeah, that's great. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go a little bit more broadly into reading as well. Do you, do you, I don't know, in Texas or in the States in general, or just more, more, more generally even that, what, how do you see the state of reading at the moment? Do you think that, uh, do you think people are reading? Do you think people are reading enough, not enough? Or what's, what do you feel about I don't that? I think read enough. <laughs> but I do yeah. think we, I see more and more children reading. Uh, some you can tell clearly they come from a reading background. They, they'll just grab anything. Yeah. We, I do see students grabbing books that are way above their level in an mm -hmm. effort to correct the reading. And uh -huh, those, if you somebody grabbing, you know, checking out a 10th grade physics book and they're in sixth grade, I hone in on them. Right. And when kids say, I don't like to read, I'm like, challenge accepted. Let's find you something. Good, so we yeah. have a functional area, which is our um, severely developmentally disabled students. Okay. One day, one of our aides brought a couple of the kids in. I thought, you know what, I'm going to take some graphic novels over to them. Let's see what happens. So I took them some magazines, some graphic novels. I said, here, while you're waiting in here, would you like to read? And they were like, yeah okay <laughs> so at the end of the little 20 minutes in there they dutifully very politely brought the books back and put them in the return thing and i thought that was the end of it well the next day one of the kids came where do i get that exciting book i was looking at yesterday i'm like okay let me remember which ones i gave you <laughs> and after that every every day he would come down and he checked the, it was a seven book series he checked everyone out read it then he came back and started at book one again <laughs> wow. and eventually to the point where I'm like okay that's not the only series we can move on to a different one so sometimes I think reading just has to be presented in a method I mean there was no push there it wasn't you yeah. have to read this but it was carefully selected that it would appeal to a teenage boy yeah can you tell us uh, any of the other strategies or, or, or ideas you've used to try and um, encourage reading more amongst the students anything you've done so, to make it seem more attractive like I said, a librarian is marketing. So a lot of times up we'll pick like Van Book Week is always very popular. And my assistant had this great idea of, of doing the, the books covered with brown paper. So she'd have a, a picture of the book, a little blurb about what it was and why it was banned, and then put a, a brown paper sheet over it. And we put those all over the school. And kids right. were coming and crying. I mean, they just like, why is this banned? We just read this in eighth grade. It's called To Kill a Mockingbird. Right. But just yeah. reading or wrapping the books in brown paper like pick a blind date, mm -hmm. even yeah. just putting books out on a shelf where they look out of place. Oh uh, yeah, okay. Because then a kid will pick it up and say, Ms. McWaters, I think this is in the wrong place. And I'm like, well, what is it? <laughs> Why uh, do you yeah, think right. it's in the wrong place? Why does it not fit there? And the other thing too is just keeping up to date with current events and making sure that books that are, I mean, our kids watch a lot of news. We, we think maybe they're not. Mm. And you're getting it obviously a lot of times from the wrong sources, but they. Yeah, I was gonna say. I think isn't in in the U.S. I I don't say this because the U.S. is special, just because this is where the data comes from. I think in the U.S. now the vast majority of people get the vast majority of their news from Facebook, right? I think that's that's yeah. That's so I, I guess where kids are going to spend a lot of their time, I imagine they they're very well aware of what's going on in them. Right, and a lot of times in schools like our school and many others have banned social media in school. Right. To me, it's more important to teach them how to use social media. Sure, then yeah, it is, I agree. It doesn't happen because I would agree. Yeah, they're going out, and the minute they get out of school, they're on of Snapchat. Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. You're not going to keep them off it. Yeah. Right. So you may as well just teach them. Let's let's look at what you're seeing on there. Is it valid? Is it is it relevant? But I don't think most of our schools the discipline problems is what they normally see it as a discipline problem because the yeah. kid is looking at YouTube instead of paying attention to the lesson. Yeah. But a lot of times I would argue relevant on YouTube. Yeah, of course. I would argue that, that most things are seen as discipline issues in the school system. I think that's one of the big problems that, that we face broadly is that many, many things that could be seen as motivation issues, could be seen as understanding, could be seen as you know a number of different ways that we might tackle something are often just put into a, a, a disciplinary box oh, yeah, and, and dealt with, with punishment. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, so you, you'd spend some time then finding, uh, finding books and materials that are relevant to the current events. And, and, right. So yeah. a lot of the things, um, one of the books that's actually on my favorite list is called On the Edge of Gone. And okay. it's about 
the future time where climate change, I can't remember if it's climate change or a, a meteor has hit the earth, but multiple people are trying to get in these generational spaceships that will take them somewhere else. And this one kid is really, really potentially very good, but he's autistic, okay. but he has the ability to work with the computers, but uh, he's not on the spaceship without mom, who's a drug addict. Okay. And it gets into a really great question is who is worthy of saving in a, a, an absolutely great space race. Yeah, wow. Well. But the underlying question in that and the discussions that we had around it were definitely, and it's not even one of the most highly recommended books, which is kind of sad. Mm -hmm. I don't even remember how I stumbled on it. Normally, I'll, I'll wander through the library on a Friday and just grab books that look like they might be of interest and take them home. Yeah, wow. Well. Do you yeah. find that the the recommended reading lists and the, the kind of standardized reading lists, do you kind of endorse them or are there, would you I look have at some other recommendations? So I, I subscribe to a database of book recommendations called um, Book Lists that's put out by American Library Association. They're not recommended okay. books, it's just a, a, serve, a, a very good synopsis of what the book is about. So that, okay. you know, I can't read every book that I put in the library, although the sure. kids think that <laughs> which is very funny. But um, yeah, it's just a matter of reading a lot of reviews and making sure, and, and from different areas. So I, I do look at Amazon reviews just mm -hmm. to get a different parental view. I look at Common yeah, okay. Sense reviews. I look at Kirkus reviews. I look at ALA book list and I don't normally buy a book unless it connects because it's not my money. It's taxpayers money. So yeah, make sure right. it's or it connects to something that's a current event that is really relevant to the students' lives. Yeah. Right. Okay. And then of course, at the end of each month, I run a, a report that shows me how many books have been checked out. And obviously I get it right some of the time and I don't get it right yeah. other time. Probably yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Okay. Um, is there anything else you think we've missed? Anything we should be talking about? I think this, we could probably talk about this for 24 minutes. Yeah, so no, I agree. Hopefully, you know, it, it makes people think about what it is that a librarian does and when they should yeah. have one and that we're not just um, book filers. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, I think I, I would hope, I think I wasn't as aware of that as I could have been. And so I'm glad I've spoken to you and, and learned a lot more and I hope others have as well. Um, can you end us with a, a, a short list of maybe your, your top five favorite books of the, I don't know, the last year or so, anything like that? So the best one that I read this year was called The Lovely War. And it, okay. if you haven't read it, it's a historical novel and it's about black soldiers in France and their lack of acceptance during the Second World War. But it's told a beautiful love story type tale, which would appeal to most people. But it, it was the fact that it delved into history. Yeah, yeah, right. I, think, um, I can't think of the name. Right off the top of my head, I'm terrible at remembering authors. I normally have to have a list. The other one we just talked about, graphic novels. There's a lot of great graphic novels out there. So March was the first one that I really got intrigued by. And that was because one of our students asked for it. But it's, it's a really good series about the civil rights movement. Okay. That led to Mouse and a lot of other graphic novels. But Mouse is a gr another great graphic novel about the historical aspects of the nazi occupation and, and the attempt to get rid of wow. jews and my latest i think i just showed it to you but this one children of blood wow. and bone it again it's a fantasy it's, it's total about magic full fiction but there's a very clear underlying message about race and i will i will leave it at that you just have to go read yeah it. you have to Brilliant. book out and i'm trying to think what else i've read oh i just read another book called anger is a gift so i end up reading books that I know that my kids are going to want to read right. be, or are going to be challenged by parents. So Anger is a Gift is about a black student in Los Angeles that becomes very angry at the treatment he's received, but ends up turning it into a positive thing. So I think that's a, that's a really good, I read that actually probably about four or five months ago. Okay. And the other, I'm trying to think of other ones that I've read. I, I read so many books. I bet. Um, what was the other one called? Oh, Ruth, Ruth, Ruta Sapetis. She writes about unusual historical associations. So yeah. she wrote a great book called Salt to the Sea, which I stumbled across in England, but it was about a, a, a group of people at the end of the Second World War that were trying to get to this, this one boat that was going to take them away and how they end up, you know, um, having, making friendships that last for life and how they actually finally escape from the Russian area of the Second World War, which is wow. a... a very not very many people talk about that area yeah 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 wow you always hear about the historical association for germany you hear about the allies coming in this was just a totally different and her new book just came out that i have not yet had a chance to read which talks about the italian area of okay. wow. so wow. 
Hey, what do you do? You have any? Do you have any opinions about uh, book to film adaptations? Do you have any? Ooh, that's a great, great topic. And apropos film, we were just talking yesterday about Gone with the Wind being removed. To me, that's akin to removing a book from the library shelves. Yeah, that's yeah, right. But there are some great books. So I loved Lord of the Rings when I was growing up, and then when I finally got to see the movie, I thought they did such a great job of it. Yeah, yeah. Whereas yeah. I think things like Harry Potter were written at a time when there was an expectation that it would be made into a movie. That clearly was not yeah. told. It's interesting you say that about Harry Potter. I, I I have a sense that Harry Potter is the series that triggered that. Everything that came after Harry Potter, I feel, was written with the hope that it would be turned into a film. I, I, I have a sense that Harry Potter might have kind of started that trend. Because uh, now you can sometimes you pick up a book and you just know that they were writing it with a film in mind, right? That seems to be. Yeah, there's a couple of books like that. And there's a couple of books that I look at and I think, oh, gosh, I hope somebody reads this and turns it into a, a great. Yeah. I mean, I, I do think The Lovely War, for example, I think her name is Berry. I think it's Julie Berry. So she wrote The Lovely War and she wrote another one about. Um, it was during the Inquisition, a young French girl that was persecuted and it's not a very big i mean obviously it's based on history but it's not something that you would ever normally even stumble across mm -hmm, mm -hmm. her books would make great movies yeah, just great. because uh, i mean the lovely war i could just see that as a movie that, that it would be perfect so hopefully somebody will pick up on it and i think children of blood and bone is already in process for a movie and that again oh, yeah, okay. it's very colorful it's very it, i could just see it being a great movie yeah 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 okay good i think what we'll try and do is uh some of those books that you've mentioned there if you can later get the um the mm -hmm. the titles and the authors and i'll put them just in a in a list along with the video uh yeah, for people to check out okay all right well brilliant jen thank you so much yeah, uh is there anywhere is there anywhere that we should be pointing people is there anywhere online that they can find you or is there anywhere in particular you, re yeah, you would so want to recommend people go the, the website is just currently under development, but I'm hoping to have it done by next week. And it's at the Charter School Librarian. Okay. Very simple. The Charter School yeah, Librarian good. website. We're the same on Facebook and we're on Instagram. So Instagram, we're just getting started with a book recommendation each day and how that book integrates into the curriculum. Okay. So when, you, when your child should read it and the questions that you should ask about it, basically. Yeah, really nice. Yeah, good. Okay. So we're working on that. Brilliant. Yeah. Okay. All right, well. I think we've got it, Jen. That's brilliant. Thanks a lot. Really interesting. Um, and as you say, I, I think there's a lot there that we haven't got to yet. So who knows? Maybe we'll uh, maybe we'll come back and do this again sometime. Right. And especially for open educational resources. That's that's another of my. Yeah, I so. definitely want to touch on that. So if that's something, uh, yeah, maybe we'll we'll do that together. All right. Okay. Great. Thanks a lot, Sounds Jen. Fun. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye now.